Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, it's our very last service in this building. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Probably some people in bed this morning are going to regret that. <laughs> Goes to show you, you got to always turn up. Amen. Amen. So, hallelujah. Father, we just open our hearts today to your word. And we thank you, Father, that you are here among us, Lord. You said we're two or more gather in your name, that you are here in our midst. So, Lord, we know you are here. And we ask that you would speak to us today in the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. We're bringing our series to a conclusion today. Uh, we've done this series for the last three weeks. This is our fourth week, our fourth and final part of Jesus Is. And we've looked, firstly, at how Jesus is the Word of God. Secondly, how Jesus is the grace of God. Last week, we looked at how Jesus is the Son of God. And um, so today, we're going to finish the series. I believe it's going to speak to you. So I ask you to just open your hearts and really hear what the Lord is saying. And again, like I said, I place great significance on the fact that this is our final meeting in this building amen so i believe the holy spirit is going to speak to you amen glory to jesus i don't believe this is the end of the church um but i do believe the lord is is saying something significant in this message uh, for those of you who go to football matches or ga matches or whatever i'm sure rugby i'm sure you've been at places at times where they've had a minute silence um i'm sure somewhere some uh, over the next few days they're going to do a minute silence for yet another um islamic atrocity uh, the usual hashtags uh, will be shared, the usual flags, etc., all that accomplishing nothing. But uh, aside from that, you know, we do silence as a mark of respect. And um, it, it's, I think it's ironic sometimes in, in football matches, you know, if it's a minute silence, when, when that is happening, it can seem like a long time. And um, there always seems to be someone somewhere who has to scream out or break the silence or, you know, there's always someone for whom... The silence is just too much. Yeah. And, um, you know, silence is not something that our society, our modern society, seems to be able to deal with. Um, you, know, uh, w w our, you know, our society doesn't seem to have any appreciation for uh, silence or, or any ability to deal with it. We seem to avoid silence at all costs. Um, you know, we have mu music piped into our ears as we travel, as we work, um, you know, even as we shop. Uh, and to the point where people are even in, the, in, in danger of losing the art of conversation. Um, you know, because people are too distracted to show any genuine interest in other people, yeah. even in their own children. I mean, one of the issues in our modern society is the, the, the idea of, of digitally, uh, digitally distracted parents. Parents who are so distracted with, you know, smartphones or TV or internet or etc. that they have no time to communicate or to engage in a real sense with their children. We've seen pictures where, you know, a family sitting in the sitting room and everybody's on a tablet or watching TV or a laptop in front of them. And even though they're close to each other, they may as well be a thousand miles apart. So again, uh, there's something more than just being physically present. There's something about being uh, actually engaged and, and, you know, giving that person your attention. Amen. So you know, I think it's sad in some ways that, you know, as a consequence of earphones and smartphones, we have created these selfish little bubbles whereby we avoid uh, contact with human beings at all costs. And you'll see that, you know, even on something like a, Le a, a Lewis that's literally packed with people, but nobody's talking. Everybody's just lost in their own little world or they're plugged in, etc. So again, I think that's one of the things that we're dealing with in our society at this time. We see even with... Um, you know, you go to restaurants, you go to bars, uh, you know, uh, they all have TVs, sitting rooms have TVs, Be you know, uh, kitchens, even bedrooms have, have TVs, you have mobile phones, internet, all of these various appliances, etc. You know, uh, you know, all these machines and, and appliances buzzing in the background, you know, to make our lives easier on, 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 in, in one sense, and yet it's all adding to this residual noise and you know, it's, it's, and, and as a consequence of this, I think it's, it's funny that in some ways we're surprised that people are lonelier than ever. In the midst of all of the noise, people are lonely. And, um, you know, because beyond the incessant noise and activity in our modern, sophisticated societies, there is a silence that we are all running from. Mankind is running from this silence. 
And, you know, maybe silence actually speaks of our mortality. Because there is never anywhere more silent than a graveyard. You know that silence that you get when you walk in there? That silence that, that descends upon a person when they take their final breath. I think it's ironic that a child is born with a cleansed fist. But when a person dies, they die with an open hand. And, you know, all the things that we, we grasp and grab for during our life, it's symbolic of the fact you can't take it with you. I've never seen a hitch on the back of a hearse. And in the same way, uh, you know, so much of what we fight for, what we, we try to accumulate is utterly meaningless. So anyway, I think that's silence. Like I said, um, there's a story about a man who was playing golf and he was on a golf course with four or five of his friends and he was just about to chip up onto the green and um, suddenly they saw a, a funeral, um, uh, just a, a funeral procession walking slowly past the golf course and in mid-swing he stops and uh, he takes off his hat, he removes, he, he, he closes his eyes and he says a silent prayer. And all of his friends are so impressed. And they said, that was the most beautiful and touching thing we've seen in years. And he said, well, thank you. Well, he said, well, you know, we were married for 35 years. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's, <laughs> some of you know, no men like that. Um, but there's something about silence that gets our attention. It, it, it gets our attention because, you know, maybe it's because it speaks to us of eternity and our unavoidable appointment with it. Every one of us have an unavoidable appointment with eternity. And there's no amount of success or wealth or, 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 or fame or any of these other things that can cause us to evade that appointment. Malachi chapter 4 verse um, 5 and 6. Malachi is the very last book in the Old Testament. And um, here Malachi is speaking, or the Holy Spirit through Malachi. And it says, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And, it will and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So um, here the Holy Spirit is speaking through Malachi in the very last book of the Old Testament. He's speaking to the children of Israel. And the final two verses are very telling because um, it, it promises a prophet. However, uh, both verses emphasize one thing, and that is hearing the voice of a father. Turning the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers. But it's also talking about the voice of the heavenly father. And you know, they say that with an all great preaching, you can hear the voice within the voice. The voice of the father speaking to his children through, um, you know, a frail, you know, you know, human being. The voice of the father. So, um, you know, fatherhood is something very significant. We've seen in, in, play, in, U, in the UK, in places like Rotherham, over the last uh, 20 years, the, the abuse scandal where, you know, there was... Over 1,400 um, children uh, sexually abused uh, by Muslim rape gangs. Now, the, uh, you know, the media in the UK was too politically correct to address that. So they called them Asian rape gangs. They weren't Asians. They weren't Chinese. You know, they weren't Filipino. They, they were actually Muslim rape gangs. They were, room, they were grooming and raping these young girls. Some of them 10, 11, 12 years of age. And... Um, and the tragedy is they knew, everybody knew it was going on. And it went on for 20 years. But they never addressed it because the police never addressed it because out of fear of being labeled racist. And to me, that's political correctness to, to the nth degree of insanity. But, um, but I think it's interesting uh, that, that, you know, the vast majority of these vulnerable girls who were, who were uh, abused and raped... Uh, and, and passed around by, by all of these perverted men, um, came from fatherless homes. They came from fatherless homes. Let me speak to the men right now. You have a high and a holy calling as a man, yeah. as a father, as a husband, to stand in the gap for your children, Amen. and to be a man, and to never abuse women. And I, I, you know, I, I think it's, 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 it's really tragic reflection of our society to where our society has come to the point where fathers have to be forced by the courts to look after their children. I think that is tragic. 
It's a tragic, uh, you know, indictment of where our society has come and to where men have, have come to. Amen? But anyway, as a man, you must be there for your kids. You must love them and support them and ask God to help you to be the man by God's grace that he has called you to be. Amen? Because, you know, the greatest gift that you can give to your children is not, you know, a, a, a college account or a new car or any other. The greatest gift you can give to your children is to love their mother. Yeah. The Bible says, Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. So, you know, as men, we're called, you know, the same way as a pastor. You're a pastor in your home. You're there to be as a servant leader. You're to love them and to serve your family in Jesus' name. Yeah. So God addresses the fathers. And God speaks to Israel here through Malachi the prophet. And then absolute silence. Almost 500 years of it. 460 years to be exact. Because Malachi was written the year 430. And again, John the Baptist comes on the scene approximately the same time as Christ. When he was 30 years of age. So, you know... Uh, 460 years is a long time. Let me just give you some perspective. 40 years ago, the troubles were in full swing here in Ireland. Uh, you know, uh, this tit for tat killing, you know, obscene acts being, uh, you know, um, Catholic against Protestant, Protestant against Catholic. Um, you know, some, some terrible, terrible things that even the wounds are, are still not healed to this day. Um, you know, a hundred years ago, World War I was still in full flight. If you were a young man under 30, you would be in a foxhole, trembling in fear in Belgium or, or France right now. That's where you would be. Think about it. That was only a hundred years ago, World War I. Two hundred years ago, Napoleon was still alive. 250 years ago, John Wesley was still blazing a trail across the UK and Ireland and America preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. This same gospel that has life, he is gone and buried, but praise God, the word of God still prevails today. Amen. Glory to Jesus. 500 years ago, this very year, a young Catholic priest called Martin Luther, was nailing his 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral in Lower Saxony. And he caused a revolution. So we can see that 460 years is a long, long time. But here we see, after a long and a glorious procession of priests and prophets and kings, the last um, uh, prophet Malachi breathes his last enters into eternity, and then silence, silence. A nation that was once familiar with hearing the voice of God, a nation that was once familiar with experiencing the miraculous interventions of Almighty God, slowly just drifts into sin and apostasy as the voice of the prophets grow silent. Nothing. Amos chapter 8 and verse 11 says, the, the time is surely coming, says the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and wander from border to border, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. You know, I, I come across Christians from all around the world, and I think it's tragic. One of the most common things they say is, it's so hard to go and hear a good sermon. I, I often wonder, what are they talking about? You know, when we place our emphasis on, on the quality of our coffee or our building or our hug. Listen, it is the Word of God. This is all you need. The Word of God is enough. Amen. And if the church will preach the Word of God, we will see those results the Word promises. But here, the Amos prophesies the time will come when there will be a, a, a complete and utter hunger for the Word of God. And, 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 and he, anyway, finally, after 500 years of, of, of complete silence, the voice of God speaking through a man is once again heard in the land of Israel. John the Baptist, the last Old Testament prophet, takes his place on the stage. And he stands between the Old and the New Testament, joining them together. Remember something, the Old is just as relevant as the New. It is the Word of God. It will speak to you. You must know both. Amen? Because they are inextric inextricably tied together. So, 
Anyway, John the Baptist takes his place. Malachi, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1. Ma- Matthew, sorry, chapter 3 and verse 1 says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent. God, is that an old-fashioned message or what? Repent. He doesn't come and try and, you know, entertain people or make people feel comfortable. Listen, if you're in sin, you should be uncomfortable. You should be uncomfortable. You know, a pastor isn't the equivalent of a doctor trying to give you a tranquilizer to take the pain away. He's not there to make you feel comfortable. It's called, the Word of God is there to cause you to address the issues in your life and get your life right with Him. Because the time will come when you stand naked before God without excuse. Every knee will bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you do not live with Jesus as Lord on, on earth... Why do you think that he would be your Lord in heaven? Repent and believe the gospel. I like to to let people know what I stand for as opposed to what I stand against. That's just playing with words. Repent. Turn from your sin. That is the gospel message and the gospel message has not changed. Stop playing games with God. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea and the region around Judah went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan confessing their sins. But when, I, I believe tremendously in grace and one of the weeks we've done how Jesus is the grace of God. But again, there's a problem in the church when people are coming to, to, to churches everywhere and they're comfortable in sin. And well, God loves me as I am. He loves you as you are, but he will not leave you as you are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. He will not leave you as you are. You can't hold on to that unforgiveness. Yeah. You can't live that homosexual lifestyle. Yeah. You can't live with your boyfriend or girlfriend and expect God to bless you. The Bible says it's sin. Turn from it. That's right. yeah. Live for Jesus or don't live for him at all. Yeah. And that is scriptural. I wish you were hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Hey, let's not play games with God. Amen. And John the Baptist had that message. And people came and they confessed their sins. And that's beautiful. God has called us to change. Jesus gives us power to change. And when many of the Pharisees and Sadducees came to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say for yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you, God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe is laid to the roots of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Praise you Jesus. You see, he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness and he lifted up his voice. He lifted up his voice with a mighty cry to almighty God. Amen. Hebrews 1 verse 7 says he makes his ministers a flame of fire. I remember when I used to go preach in the, in the prison in, in Galveston, uh, Texas, on the way, used to drive past Texas City. And I remember the oil refineries, they used to be burning off gas. And there used to be these flames, you know, a couple of hundred feet up in the air. And you could see it from, from miles and miles around. And this is our calling as, as preachers. You know, we're not here to give you a nice little talk and make you feel comfortable. We're here to pour out the word of God before you. And the word of God comes as fire. It will convict you. It will make you uncomfortable. But it will cause you to change. It will cause you to change. Amen. So he makes his ministers a flame of fire. You know, one reason why so many people ignore the church is because so many ministers are giving boring, dead messages that are just there to make you feel nice and comfortable. No, the Word of God will convict you. It will confront you in your sin. Amen? It will change you in Jesus' name. Amen? So if ever there was a minister of fire, it was John the Baptist. Amen? Because he raised his voice and his voice resonated. Not just in the valleys and mountains of Israel, but his voice resonated deep inside hell itself. 
His voice was serving notice on the devil and the powers of darkness that their time of subverting people, their time of dominating and ruling and ruining eternal souls was over. Why? Because the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was now upon the earth and he was about to step into his ministry. Matthew 4, the people who dwelt in darkness have seen a great light. And those who lived under the domination of darkness, amen, a true light has dawned. Jesus came as a light into a dark place. You see, the Messiah had been promised, uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God promised, he said, of the seed of the woman, he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Jesus came to crush Satan's head. He came, a, you know, on a search and, and rescue mission. He came to seek and save that which was lost. Genesis 22 and verse 8, Abraham prophesied by the Spirit when he declared God will provide himself a lamb. Even then, God was speaking through uh, Abraham that God was, was, was bringing a, a savior. He was bringing a lamb who would take away the sin of the world. Amen. And now this time had finally come for Jesus to arrive on the earth. Revelation 13, 9 says, All inhabitants of the world will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the lamb's book of life, the lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. The Romans didn't kill Jesus. The Jews didn't kill Jesus. God had foreordained that Jesus Christ, our Savior, would take our place on that lonely cross. His death was not an accident. It was purposed by the heart of our Father who saw us in our sin and who sent Jesus Christ. You see, our Father had planned long before we had sinned, long before He'd even created the world, He had planned to send Jesus to save us. The very name of Jesus means God saves. Emmanuel, God with us. The fact that Jesus came meant that God was with us. He's not against us. He loves you and He proved His love for you by sending Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen today? John chapter 1 and verse 19. Here talking about John the Baptist. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to say, Who are you? He continued, said, I did, uh, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, said, Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. They kept... I'm sure that would have fed your ego to have these important people come from Jerusalem to come and ask who you are. And yet he refused to talk about who he was. He just wanted to talk about who Jesus is. As the church, we have to come back to the place where the focus is on Jesus. He said, what you say about yourself. He refused to say anything about himself. He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent with them from the Pharisees, and they asked them, saying, Why didn't you baptize if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Jesus, John answered and said, I baptize with water, but there stand ones among you who you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, while this prophetic voice, um, you know, boldly, uh, you, you know, announced the Messiah and went before him, you know, and, and while his was a bold voice, it was a strong voice, but it was also a humble voice. The voice of John was a humble voice. I was talking to a lady this week. I was at UCB Radio doing my program and she had gone to a meeting during the week and she talked about, you know, this famous preacher was speaking and she said, you know, it wasn't very good because all he did was talk about how successful he was and how big his church was and how many things he did. And, you know, listen, church, we have to lift up the lamb. It is so important. We lift up Jesus because all we are is dust. The time will come, you know, when we just pass from this earth. What have you done to lift up Jesus? Because we are living in such a narcissistic culture, you know, just selfies and this obsession with self. No, we got to take our eyes off us and put them on Jesus Christ. 
Amen. You know, we have this sinful tendency towards ego and pride. But when John's moment comes to stand in the, in the spotlight, he just, he just steps aside and he firmly turns the light back on Jesus Christ. You see, the, the author of the book of Hebrews understood this. Hebrews 12 verse 2. Looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I think it was D.L. Moody once said, you know, uh, if you look... Uh, if you look within, you're going to be uh, filled with, with all sorts of anxiety and fear. He says, if you look around you, you're going to be distracted. But he said, if you look at Jesus, look unto Jesus. That is the answer because that is where you're going. John, John Fletcher, he was a Methodist preacher, 1729 to 1785. He said this, only look to Jesus. He died for you, died in your place, died under the frowns of heaven that we might die under its smile. Think about that. Jesus died under the frowns of heaven that you might die under its smile. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God for Jesus. You see, after this long 460 years of complete and utter silence, of, of complete silence where there was no prophet speaking, thus says the Lord. You know, no, no prophet revealing the heart of God, speaking to his people. When God chose to break the silence, when God chose to break the silence with the brilliant yet brief career of John, what did he say? Isaiah 52, 6, I am the God who speaks. Um, Hebrews 3.15, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. It's clear that he is the God who speaks and we must therefore listen. Yeah. That's the problem with some of you. You're constantly talking. Your prayer life consists of only you talking. Yeah. You never take time to listen. Say, Lord, what are you saying to me? Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So we must listen. But what was God actually saying to mankind through John the Baptist? Because the long silence that preceded um, his voice being once again heard in the land of Israel, you know, was placing an even, an even greater emphasis, you know, and importance on what was actually being said. So what was he saying? John 1, 29. What was his message? His message was, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's not just the Word of God. He's not just the grace of God. He's not just the Son of God. He is the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb. Amen. Church, it is time for us to once again behold the Lamb. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Church, our ultimate calling is to be Christ-like. We are called to Christ-likeness. It says, again, when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. Amen. But if we're called to Christ-likeness, I want to ask you this question. Are you helping or are you hindering other people from seeing Jesus through you? Because again, your life may be the only Bible another person may ever read. What message is your life giving forth to the world around you? Because you see, if, if we want to be like him, we must first see him. Behold the lamb. Don't just relegate that to history. Don't just relegate that to salvation. Behold him on a daily basis. Do you see Jesus? Because if you do not behold him, you will never be able to let others behold him through you. Church, do you want to be just like Jesus? Do you want to be just like Jesus? John chapter 3 verse 26. If we want to be like Jesus, then we must walk in the same spirit of humility that was exemplified by John the Baptist. John walked, yes, he had a powerful anointing, and yet he was a very humble man. Uh, John chapter 3 verse 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. He 
Uh, but the friend of the bridegroom who already hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase. I must decrease. How contrary that is to the spirit of our times. He must increase. I must decrease. You know, we, we all rejoice in the scripture. It says God lifts up one. He puts down another. We always assume he's going to be lifting us up. But we should rejoice just as much when he is putting us down as when he's lifting us up. Yeah. There was a time when I was a youth pastor and suddenly a few decisions were made where the, all the doors are closed on ministry. And, and, you know, one week I was talking to between the two groups, probably a hundred odd young people. And the next week, for next four or five years, we had nothing. We, had, we, we didn't speak anywhere. And... In the natural, it looked like I was demoted, but I didn't realize that God didn't just want me to be a youth pastor. He had called me to pastor a church in this city. And what looked like a demotion was a promotion. And during those years, I put in a deep foundation in the Word of God, and I sought God, and I prayed, and I spent time with Him, and He prepared me for everything that He had prepared for me. Are you preparing for everything God has prepared for you? Hallelujah. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah. Amen? So we must walk in that same spirit. He must increase. I must, I must decrease. In order for us to behold Him, we must walk in that spirit of humility. Amen. We must drop our ambition, our, our, our petty arguments and agendas and our suspicion. And we must adopt a kingdom mentality. Yeah. Hebrews 9.22, it says, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The Israelites were very familiar with the principle of an innocent lamb suffering in the place of a guilty sinner. They understood that the innocent had to suffer and die in order for the guilty to live. Fact is, they owed their very existence as a nation to the, to the Passover lamb, the, the, the feast the Jews celebrate every year, the fe feast, of, feast of Passover. Let's turn quickly to the book of Exodus chapter 12. I'd encourage you to read all of this chapter. I don't have, uh, time doesn't permit me to do that today, but I, I would like to address some, some very salient points within this. And uh, he, he, Exodus 12 verse 1, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Do you know that Passover marks the start of the year in the Jewish calendar? And in the same way, the Passover marks our beginning because you have two birthdays. You have the day you were born physically and you have the day that you are born again. The day you receive Jesus as your Savior. That is when your life really started. Yeah. Amen. And it says, your lamb shall be without blemish. A lamb of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. In the same way, Jesus, our lamb, was without blemish. You know, Pilate said, I find no fault in him. Herod looked at him. Uh, the chief priests looked at him. They couldn't find any fault with him. Why? He was the perfect lamb. Hallelujah. He was the perfect lamb that came in our place. Jesus. For I will pass through, verse 12, the land of Egypt on that night. And I will strike the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plagues will not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Glory to Jesus. The blood shall be a sign on you and on your homes. In the same way, the blood of Jesus covers you. That's why you can declare in the face of the devil or demons or sickness or plagues, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Any tongue that rises against me in judgment shall be condemned. Why? You are washed in the blood. Is there anybody today can say I'm washed in the blood? I'm covered by the blood. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. You can plead the blood of your family. They may not be where they need to be right now, but you can plead the blood of them in Jesus' name. Proclaim the blessings of God when the devil is out there trying to destroy somebody, trying to put cancer on somebody, trying to destroy somebody's life in a car accident. He comes along and he says, oh, oh. He says to the other demons, no, no, back off. The blood covers that person. You can't touch them. You got to pass over. Amen. You got to pass over. No way you can't touch them. Why? You're covered by the blood. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So... Exodus describes the Passover lamb and the lamb brought deliverance from slavery. 
protection from the destroyer, healing from sickness, disease, and deliverance from poverty. And most importantly, it covered their sin. The lamb, they would shed the, the blood of the lamb, it would cover their sin for the year. It didn't take away their sin, it covered it. So it was the equivalent of our modern day road tax. Those of you who have a car understand you need to pay your road tax every year to be legal on the road. The, the road tax, when you pay for it, uh, doesn't last for an indeterminate amount of time. It lasts for 12 months. After that 12 months, you have to go back again and be, pay for your road tax again to be legal. So too, they had to get the blood covering their sin every year. And this is why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, this Lamb was different. He didn't just cover your sin. He took it away. Glory to God. Amen. This is why it's so powerful. You know, on Mount Moriah, Abraham encountered God's miraculous provision and salvation through the substitution of an innocent Lamb. He was about to kill his son. God said, said no and he slayed uh, the, he killed a lamb in his place and you see ultimately all of these old testament stories were types and shadows of Jesus Christ the lamb of God and you see the bible says that Christ is the literal fulfillment of all of these types and shadows in the old testament that's why 1 Corinthians 5, 7 says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. Can you give a shout of praise that Jesus was sacrificed for you? <laughs> Romans chapter 10, verse 4 says, Christ is the end of the law in order to bring righteousness to everyone who believes. But this righteousness isn't predicated on your performance. It's not based on how holy you are or how much you have given, how well you have lived. This righteousness is predicated on the cross of Calvary alone. It is not based on your performance. It is based on Christ's performance. Amen. That is why we can rejoice because this righteousness is imputed to us by simply believing. It is by grace, not by law. Yeah. Amen. And you know, this is why, you know, many of us refer to Christ as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And that's, uh, that's beautiful because he is. But you know, there's only one New Testament reference to Christ as the lamb. However, with regards to Christ, or to, to Christ as the lion, but regards to Christ as the lamb, it's interesting that there are 33 references to Christ, the lamb. There is one reference to him as the lion. Wow. Most of us, unless you've studied, would, wouldn't realize that. And, and, and yet, I think it's interesting that Jesus came as the lamb of God. Luke chapter 3 says he started his, work, his ministry at the age of 30. And he died at the age of 33. And the New Testament has 33 references to Christ as the Lamb. Why? He was the literal fulfillment or embodiment of the Lamb of God. He came as the Lamb. And yet many of us regard the Lamb as being part of Christ's previous identity because of, of the identity of the Lamb with regards to the cross. And, and therefore we kind of look at it as being almost like a previous identity and he's the, the lion today. But it's actually not biblically true because the cross is a finished work, but his identity as the lamb is not a finished work. It is part uh, uh, very much of who he is today. Because, you know, there's four books in the Bible that refer to Christ as the lamb. Four books. Uh, the book, the Gospel of John, um, the, the book of Acts, uh, First Peter, and revelations. Now, which book in the Bible has the most references to Christ as the Lamb? Revelation. Revelation. Amen? Revelation. There is two references in the Gospel of John, one in Acts, one in uh, 1 Peter. So therefore, that leaves 29 of those references are in the book of Revelation. Now, this is not a trick question. Does Revelation primarily focus on the future of the church or the past? It's focused on the future primarily. And obviously we're, so the, you know, many of these things are coming to pass. However, the focus of Revelation is on the future. And therefore, the Lamb is certainly part of, of Christ's identity, uh, not just now, but in the future. And um, let, let me just quickly read some references from Revelations. Revelations 5, 5 and 6. The elders refer to a lion, and yet John sees a lamb. Um, Revelations 5, 12 declares, Worthy is the lamb who is slain. Revelation 6, 16 declare, de, refers to the wrath of the Lamb. 
Revelation 7, 9, 10, and 14 declares that, uh, that one day that we will stand before the Lamb and that salvation belongs to the Lamb and that our robes have been washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelations 15 and 3 says one day we will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Revelation 17, 4 tells us the powers of the Antichrist will fight against the Lamb. And by implication, they will fight against those who are with the Lamb. But through Jesus, we overcome. Amen. Revelations 19, 7 refers to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelations 21, 14, the apostles of the Lamb. Revelations 21, uh, 21 to 23 gives us a beautiful picture of the glorious new Jerusalem. But it doesn't say that it's lit by LEDs or spotlights. It says the glory of the Lamb is what lights Jerusalem. Revelations 22, 1 and 3 refers to the throne of God and the Lamb. Are you getting the picture that the Lamb has everything to do with our future and not just our past? Amen. Could you give a shout of praise to Jesus right now? Amen. So that was my introduction. I'm going to quickly go through just three points, okay? If you listen quickly, we'll finish quickly, amen? Um, through the Lamb, three points. The first one is this. Through the Lamb, I have life. In Him was life, and that life was the light of man. John chapter 1 and verse 2 to 4. In Him was life. That word Greek is zoe, which means life in the same nature and quality as God has it. In Him was life, and that life was the light of man. And we can see as our societies gradually turn from the teachings of the Bible and from the example of Jesus Christ, the further into barbarity and darkness and paganism that we go. I think it's interesting that so many who claim to be so enlightened and so cultured think nothing about tearing a little baby apart in its mother's womb. When we turn from Jesus, we turn to darkness. When we turn from the Bible, we turn back to perversion and sin. That is why you must make a decision to stand for Jesus in these days. And to st stand by your convictions without apology. Because you are living in a world that is trying to paint the church into a corner and try and get you to um, compromise and get you to apologize for who God is and what he stands at. But ultimately, their problem is not with you. Their problem is with God. Because God is the one who defines right and wrong. We do not get to redefine it. God has defined marriage as one man, one woman. You don't like that? That's tough. God isn't changing for anybody. Hallelujah. Through the Lamb, I have life. John 10, 10, Jesus said, Satan comes to rob, to kill, to destroy. But I have come. Yeah. That you might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. There's two plans for every human being. Satan has a destroy, desire and a plan to kill you. God has a plan to bless you. Yeah. You will cooperate with one or the other. But through the Lamb, I have life. Where did we ever get the idea that Christianity was simply about rules and rituals? Where did we ever get that idea? Jesus said, I have come that you would have life. Yeah. Not that you would have a religion. Yeah. Ultimately, it ma makes no difference whether you're Protestant, Catholic, Baptist, Pentecostal, Presbyterian. Unless you know Jesus, you're on your way to hell. But if you know Jesus, if you've called on the Lamb, if you've been washed in His blood, then you have that assurance that heaven is your home, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and that you're His forevermore. Glory to Jesus, people. That would be a good place to say amen. The Lamb of God enables us to rediscover life. Many of us here today can testify, just like Jim, to the fact that we only really began to live the moment we received Christ as our Savior. Because you know in a world where people are constantly looking for the ultimate high. You know, travel the world. Oh, I have to, I have to find myself, you know. Travel the world or make it to the top or get rich quick or live life to the max. Or all these other empty buzzwords that mean ultimately nothing. 
Uh, you know, we see the spread of the shallow celebrity culture where the focus is completely upon your appearance and your, you, you know, all of these things that really mean nothing. The spread of cosmetic surgery, you know, these endless diet and fitness and, and you know, uh, uh, diet fads, etc. This obsession with youth, with staying long, young and looking young, all of that ultimately is simply rooted in the fear of death. People are terrified of death. And that's why they're doing everything they can to fight the process of aging, to fight against, you know, death. But ultimately, as a Christian, you don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear growing older. It's just the reality of living in a fallen world. You can't change it. But through Christ, you don't have to fear it. Amen. Amen? You, because ultimately, you are not ready to die. Amen? You're not ready to live until you're ready to die. You, you're not ready to, to live. That's what most people are afraid of living. Why? Because they're afraid of dying. Because true Christ, without Christ, you're not ready to die. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Every man, every woman, irrespective of how virtuous or holy they think they are, are guilty. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You see, our sin separates us from God, Isaiah 52 and 9. But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. The New Living says, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. You know, if you came here today for a 20-minute sermon, please feel free to leave. But I'm going to finish this message, okay? And I think it's important. You know what? If you don't listen with a good attitude to the Word of God, it's simply a reflection of where you're at with Him. And there's a bigger question you need to ask yourself. This is the Word of God. And this book determines where we spend eternity, okay? It's once a week. If you can't deal with it, this probably is not the church for you. I just throw it out there, okay? Because I'm not here to apologize for the Word of God. And I'm not here to snip it down to a little 15-minute sermonette that says nothing and offends nobody. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away. He doesn't just cover. He takes away our sin. He takes away our sin. He takes away the stain of sin. Some of you have struggled all of your life with feelings of shame and guilt. But Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, if you've been under a burden of shame and guilt, Christ is the one who can set you free. Why? He carried that heavy burden all the way to the cross for you. Amen. He took it. Amen. He, he took your place so you could be released from sin. I love the inspiring story of that Catholic priest, um, Father Maximilian Colby, who took the place of another man so he could live. This, he was a, a, a Polish Franciscan friar who volunteered to die in the place of, in the German death camp of Auschwitz in World War II. It was 17th of February 1941. His monastery was shut down. He was arrested. Um, he was given the number of prisoner number 16670. He continued to act as a priest. But he was subjected to violent harassment, including beating and lashing. At the end of July 1941, three prisoners disappeared from the camp of Auschwitz. And it prompted the SS deputy camp commander to pick 10 men to be starved to death in an underground bunker to deter further escape attempts. When one of the selected men, um, uh, Francis uh, Gechowicz, cried out, My wife, my children... Colby volunteered to take his place. According to an eyewitness, an assistant janitor at the time, in his prison cell, Colby led the prisoners in prayer. Each time the guards checked on him, he was standing or kneeling in the middle of the cell, looking calmly at those who entered. After two weeks of dehydration and starvation, only Colby remained alive. The guards wanted the bunker emptied, so they gave Colby a lethal injection of carbolic acid. Colby is said to have raised his left arm and calmly waited for the deadly injection and died. You see, 1 Corinthians 5.21 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, the cross was a place of exchange. Yes. 
We exchanged our pain for his peace, our shame for his righteousness, our grief for his joy, and our brokenness for his wholeness. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 2.9 says, We see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little time, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. The New Living says, yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. Because he tasted death for you, you will never taste of it. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You may fall asleep on this earth, hearing the voice of your loved ones weeping around you. But when you open your eyes, you're going to open them to the sounds of heaven, to the glory of God's redeemed, singing the song to the Lamb. You're going to open your eyes to to see the glory of God. You're going to be standing on streets of gold. That would be a good place to say amen. That would be a good place to say thank you, Jesus. Through the Lamb, I have life. And you know what? Seeing as my last message here in this building, hallelujah, I'm going to give it everything I have. Amen? Amen. John chapter 5 and verse, um, John chapter 5 and verse 24. And it says, most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death to life john 6 47 and it says most assuredly i say to you he who believes in me has everlasting life it's not something you're going to get down the road when you're more virtuous or when you've earned it no it's something that we receive through the lamb of god through the lamb i have life through the lamb i have love john 3 16 god so loved the world That he gave his only son that whoever believes him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, in a world that is literally starving for affection and love and compassion, the the Lamb of God is such a beautiful reminder to us of the fact that God loves a broken, hurting world. God so loved the world he gave. The cross is eternal testament and proof of the fact that God loves people. He loves you. In spite of where you fail, in spite of where you fall, he loves you. Luke chapter 23 and verse 33. It's got to be one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right hand and the other on his left. I think it's sad that in many times in the church, we only emphasize these verses once a year at Easter. We should look at them every day of the week and thank God. He paid the price for my sin. And it says he was crucified between two criminals, one on his right, one on his left. You know why? He came as a man and he identified with sinful mankind and he died with sinners. He lived with sinners. He was a friend of sinners and he still is one today. Jesus took your place on that cross. You see, that middle cross was reserved for a sinner and it had your name on it. It had my name on it. But Jesus took our place and he took our sin. True, the lamb I have loved. And this is why even as he was taking his final breaths, it says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. Even as he lay dying, even as the life was leaving his body, he was crying out not for vengeance. He was crying out for forgiveness. The lamb is eternal proof of the fact that you are loved by God. You are loved by him. You might have your struggles. You might have your issues, but you are loved. Never forget that God loves you and he loved you enough to die for you. So many times in Christianity, we emphasize how we need to believe in God. And yet we neglect to focus on how God believed in us. He believed in us enough to give his son for us. And you see, it is his love that makes us whole. We're only made whole to the degree that we know that we are loved. The Bible says perfect love casts out fear. You see rejection and shame and fear and guilt. They're the opposite of love. It's his love that makes us whole. You know, it's his love. You know, it's a love that you can't understand with your head. It's a love that you must feel in your heart. Because it's a love that will heal your heart and heal your home. The Bible talks in Ephesians 3. The love that you would know the love of God that passes understanding. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. May I simply present to you today. You can never be filled with the fullness of God until you know the love of God. Until you know how much he loves you. 
until you know the price that he paid for you. Amen. Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with us freely, graciously give us all things? The New Living says, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? You see, this love gives us assurance in the face of the trials and traumas and temptations of life. For you cannot see Christ hanging there on that cross in your place and ever doubt that he loves you again. Or ever doubt that he will bring you through what you're going through. Luke 24, 39. Behold my hands and my feet. Jesus said, Behold my hands and my feet. To this very day, Jesus carries those marks on his hands and on his feet. And those marks are the proof of your eternal worth to God. Those marks are a literal receipt for your soul. They are proof even today that the price has been paid by God. It's a, it's a, a, a public declaration that all debts have been paid and that you are loved by God. Deuteronomy 7, 6, you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on the earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. Can you ever again doubt that you have value, that he loves you and that you are precious to him? Deuteronomy 20, 14 and 2, you have been set apart to the Lord your God. He has chosen you from all the nations of the earth to be his own special treasure. Deuteronomy 26, 18, the Lord has declared today you are his people, his own special treasure. You see, you won't find meaning within the walls of academia because ultimately they will only tell you that you're just a refined animal. You know, you won't find meaning, you know, within the arena of sport because all of your awards and accolades will only simply highlight your deep sense of dissatisfaction and disillusionment. You know, we see Tiger Woods this week uh, arrested and my heart went out to the man because he just looked so unhappy. In spite of all of his accomplishments, it's meaningless. All of your awards, all of your trinkets, all of your accomplishments are nothing in the light of eternity. Do you know the Lamb? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Because you're not going to find meaning within the corridors of power because, you know, as you desperately climb the ladder of success, when you get to the top, you will discover that there is nothing up there. But look at Jesus, behold the Lamb, behold the Lamb, and you will realize that your soul is of infinite value to Almighty God, because He looked from eternity, and He said, I want Him. He looked from eternity, He says, I want her, I have a plan for them. In Mark 8, 36, what should a prophet a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I've realized this, we've looked at that verse from a completely wrong perspective. We've looked at it from the negative. However, when I look at it now, I suddenly realize that God declares that one eternal soul is of more value than all the vast wealth of this world combined. Amen. What's a prophet you to gain the whole world but lose your soul? God says your soul is more valuable. Yeah than gold or silver or diamonds or any of these other things. Through the Lamb I have life. Through the Lamb I have love. And lastly, as I finish, through the Lamb, I have liberty. Yeah. I have liberty. I am free. Yeah. Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. John chapter 8 verse 36. The new living. So if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. The Lamb alone brings us liberty. Because deep in, on the inside of every person is a desire to be free. It may manifest itself in a desire to excel in business or sport or politics, you know. But, but ultimately, that freedom can't be found in wealth or fame or success. That, that, that satisfaction, that, that happiness can't be found in any ideology or philosophy. It's only found in Jesus. Psalm 105, 37, he brought them forth with silver and gold and there was not one feeble person among their tribes. Think about this 430 years of slavery, of stress, of anxiety, of fear, of sickness, of, of malnutrition, of, of sorrow, of death, of pain, of depression, of frustration, of, of intimidation. All ended in one moment through just one lamb. One lamb brought the people out of slavery. 1 Corinthians 1.27, God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. You know, try to explain to a non-Christian audience about how God brought liberty to all of mankind. Not through some marvelous huge army, but rather through a lamb. 
God brought liberty to us through a lamb. You know, is there any animal on this earth that is closer to the living embodiment of a cuddly toy than a lamb? They're so innocent and so playful. Do you ever see the way they, they kick their four legs and just jump straight up in the air? It's so cute. They're, so, they're such a lovely animal. You know, I think lambs and koala bears are the two closest things you'll get to a little t- cuddly toy. But, 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 you know, the irony is that, is that God uses this, this lamb to bring liberty. But liberty from what? Or rather, liberty from whom? The lamb brought us liberty from Satan and all of his demonic forces. From poverty, from sickness, from disease. The Lamb purchased your liberty. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. You've not been redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Your soul has been purchased by the blood of the Lamb. And that's why the Bible says in Psalm 107, verse 2, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You need to rise up and serve notice on Satan and all of his powers. And you t- to tell them, you know what? Uh, hallelujah. Your time of ruling and dominating my life is over. It's time to serve notice on Satan. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Declare in the face of the works of the enemy, I have been redeemed. I've been redeemed from poverty and lack. It has no place in my life. I've been redeemed from sickness. Devil, you're a liar. I'm not going to die young. The Bible says with long life, you will satisfy me and show me your salvation glory to God let the redeemed of the Lord say so declare sickness you've got no place in me in Jesus name why Isaiah 53 by his stripes we were healed how many of you believe that today could you stand to your feet and give a shout of praise to the Lord in Jesus name amen oh father we worship you Praise God. If the worship group could come to the front as we finish. Praise God. You need to thank God. By his stripes, I was healed. The Lord Jesus is here in this place today. He loves you. Amen. He has a plan and a purpose for you. He cares about you. He knows about where you struggle. He knows about the issues that are going on in your life. And irrespective of how big your problems are. I'm... I'm a pastor. I know that. I've got to, I need to find a building before next Sunday. <laughs> but as big as our problems are, our Savior is bigger. Yeah. He is bigger. Yeah. He is greater. Yeah. And He yeah. is with us. Yeah. Amen. Whatever you have-